So I'd like to acknowledge the lands on which my colleagues and I live and work. For those of you who aren't in Australia, you may not have encountered this before. An acknowledgement of country is very often found at the beginning of presentations or classes, and it's used as a sign of respect to our First Nations people. In it, we recognise not only the First Nations people, but also the unbroken and continuous nature of their culture, technologies and knowledge systems, including pedagogy. I'd like to acknowledge that our guide was written across Ngunnawal, Ngambri, Wongal and Wurundjeri country by working together and sharing our knowledge. We'd like to acknowledge that the traditional owners have been creating, protecting and sharing knowledge on these lands for thousands of years. Okay, these guidelines were co-created by four ANU staff, two academics, Guru Kaur in the National Centre for Epidemiology and Bernardo Pereira Nunez in the School of Computing and two educational designers in the Centre for Learning and Teaching, me and April Chan. These guidelines began from an epidemiology conference escape room activity run by Guru, which led to a teaching and learning grant with Bernardo and Guru. From that, via the Centre for Learning and Teaching, an organic collaboration with April and I occurred. This co-design approach has resulted in a guide that combines current evidence in educational escape rooms, practical educational escape room experience, and relevant pedagogical uh, concepts. The goal isn't to tell anyone what to do, but to support evidence-informed choices. It helps make sure decisions are purposeful by raising relevant considerations and discussing potential outcomes of different choices. The guidelines themselves are a series of steps for creation that help to structure your thinking and the design process. We've intentionally provided a lot of detail and stated the obvious, because those things aren't obvious to everyone, especially if you're new to escape rooms. Now, while we won't go through the whole document, we'd like to give you a sneak peek by discussing some of the highlights. First, Guru will talk you through some of the behind the scenes practical guidance on puzzle making, themes, storylines and riddles. Then I'll discuss the impact of purpose on escape room design choices, including some of the trade offs that occur as a result of certain decisions. I'll also discuss methods to increase accessibility and inclusion in educational escape rooms. We hope then to have time for some questions, moderated by April. With that, I'll hand over to Guru. Oh, thanks for that, Sue. Um, so, as Sue mentioned, I'm going to walk you through what we hope are very practical and very pragmatic steps um, in these educational escape room guidelines. Guidelines come how to kind of guide. I know that when I started working in my own escape room as an applied, before applied epidemiologist, by applied epidemiologist, I really kind of had wished that someone had given me more practical considerations of how to make all of this work and how to turn it from what is really an entertaining and activity for a lot of students to a more helpful learning activity that was backed by pedagogy, especially for quite busy academics don't have a lot of time, who don't have a lot of funding, and anyone else that would have been interested in running an escape room. So as you might be able to see from this beautiful snake here that April's made for us, um, we kind of want to get to those, we want to be able to make an escape room through kind of seven quite straightforward steps. I say straightforward. Um, step one is really about setting the stage with ensuring that there's been really careful consideration given to scoping, to understanding the goals of the escape room and having a really upfront intentional considerations for inclusion and equity. It was really important for all of us involved in this to not have inclusion and equity as something that you tack on at the end, but rather that it was really a thoughtful consideration right from the beginning of the inception of any escape room. Um, step two really starts to get into the fun bits and bobs of theme setting and developing storylines. Like what does it mean to develop a storyline arc, especially if you haven't been like a TV writer in the past? I certainly had to learn that from the hard parts. Um, step three really works through game flow and understanding the order of things and why it matters as to why what order things should be in and what orders can interrupt learning. Step four is about puzzle making, which I think a lot of my academic peers at the ANU have kind of jumped into very quickly. Uh, props and the roles of hints. 
Step five, we've kind of left for allowing for reflection about rules and safety procedures and really bringing this kind of pedagogical approach back in. Uh, step six is what kind of I think so many of us forget about, and I certainly made many mistakes, but field testing. How do you field test and how do you do it well and what do you really need to look out for? And then finally, in step seven, we kind of started to go into the nitty gritty details about facilitation, giving feedback to students that's meaningful on their performance and what evaluation could potentially look like for an educational escape room. So, uh, April, thanks. <laughs> so before kind of even jumping into how to put an escape room together, I think I'm sure this has been well covered, but it's like anything else, you start with a why. So for any meaningful endeavour, we always start with those whys. So why are we doing this? We really want people to reflect on that. We've given a list of kind of really clear questions as part of this scoping exercise. So why are you doing this instead of another type of learning activity or assessment? And what learning outcomes are you going to try to assess? So in my Disco Fever Educational Escape Room, it was really born out of wanting to address issues around teamwork that is really commonly seen in field epidemiology workforces. But it was also to throw out the traditional case study approach after students kept reporting back to us semester after semester that we don't want to do any more case studies. It's been death by case studies. Um, and my colleagues and I really wanted to be able to deal with really core problems that were presented in novel ways, because in our case, even though no two outbreaks are really the same, the general approach to how you solve them is the same. So we really found that the why will determine really so much about kind of how to set up a storyline, the game flow, and then how you're going to approach puzzle making. So we really wanted to kind of encourage these guidelines to spend a lot of time on the why before going into everything else, because we think if you get the why right, a lot of the other pieces start to fall into place quite naturally. So let's say that we've now figured out the why, we're happy to move on. We then move on with our guidelines to say that, OK, what next? Well, let's set up a theme, right? And theme setting and story creation is a really crucial early step as well, and not to be left until later stages, because this will really tell you the direction and the natural arc your escape room is going to follow. So some areas do more naturally fit, i.e. in my case, the story of what an outbreak investigation could look like. But in saying that, what we've kind of also realised is that it's not, you shouldn't be afraid of taking on what are considered to be more difficult themes, perhaps. So you may find that you end up engaging students in much larger conversation. One of the obvious ones that I've been mulling over quite deeply over the past few months has been decolonisation Indigenous rights. This is a really important topic in Australia at the moment, particularly in higher education. And in Australia, this is something that we will find really difficult to have conversations about. So much like using potentially humour to disarm people, we think that an educational escape room could be the perfect way to have that conversation about what is a very complex topic. So, of course, there's also the opportunity for industry-based themes. So why not use an escape room to get students to be in a simulation of what a job interview situation could be like? Or how do you deal with a colleague that's trying to sabotage you? So could an escape room be a way to train students in these skills before they even hit the workforce? We've included really clear guidelines on the timelines and the number of objectives of, and how to keep storylines simple based on the evidence, which has been put forward by actually a lot of people that are in this showcase today over the next, over the next day. I say today and tomorrow because I'm in Australia, but over the next day. Now we get to what I think a lot of people kind of consider to be the really fun part of this, which is what is a puzzle? Well, I've always kind of thought, isn't a puzzle just a problem to solve? I mean, that's definitely kind of the way that I originally approached it. And then from there, we've kind of tried to talk, talk you through it, what is it more deeply? So we talk about what are cognitive puzzles? What are physical puzzles? What constitutes a meta puzzles and what are the pros and cons of each of these types of puzzles based on the type of learning outcomes that you're actually trying to achieve with your students with your students sorry so how do you know what puzzle to make how do you make a puzzle how are you going to consider grading difficulty in puzzles which is something that i think within the escape room from an entertainment side and an educational side is something that's incredibly difficult to kind of do 
Um, how do you know where to place puzzles in the room? What is the red herring effect? What does it mean when you've accidentally hidden too many puzzles? How does that impact students' learning? My learned experience has been, I'm sure like a lot of other people, that students seem to never look at the things that are directly in front of them, but they'll be happy to rip your room right apart. But is that a bad thing? Maybe not. Maybe it just means that they're more engaged in their learning. And once you've got all these puzzles, the big challenge then is how do you keep the repository of puzzles that you have fresh? How do you keep it that students don't kind of talk amongst each other and kind of tell each other from cohort to cohort what the solution is? But even if you do tell them what the, if they tell each other what the solution is, does that matter? So all of these are types of questions that we've tried to raise and provide some sort of guidance around um, in our guidelines. And just to talk you through an example of a puzzle, one thing that I've been asked by so many people, and I'm sure, again, a lot of people in this showcase have been asked as well, is when implementing this, is how do you actually go about making a puzzle? And to be honest, I feel a little bit silly because you're probably already doing it already. Um, I'm an applied EP and I see things everywhere. So when coming up with a puzzle for my own escape room, I thought, well, isn't this Connect 4 really just kind of this? Isn't it just an epidemiological curve? It just seemed like a really natural fit to me. So it seemed so obvious to me when I was faced with this puzzle, but I had so many students make exactly the same mistakes that they make in classes. So it wasn't until that they worked through the physical puzzle itself and worked through what they thought what they thought was kind of something relatively straightforward, that they finally seemed to kind of click and have this aha moment. And that's exactly kind of as an educator, exactly what I kind of want to see. So as I mentioned before, giving students just an opportunity to see the same old problems in new ways can be incredibly rewarding for both them and for you. And with that, I'll leave it to Sue to talk more deeply about the pedagogical side of things. Thanks, Guru. Let's talk pedagogy. Um, your escape room can and should be very different depending on its purpose. The guidelines talk about the purpose and the impact on design, depending on whether your assessment aims to evaluate students or support student learning. Escape rooms that are used for evaluation are often called summative assessments, and they aim to certify a student's skill or knowledge level. They'll typically emphasise security, authenticity and accessibility to ensure that they assess what they aim to. These can have unintended impacts on the validity of the assessment, however, depending on how they're implemented, which we'll talk about shortly. An escape room can also be used for learning, either as a learning activity, a revision tool or for formative assessment. Formative assessment is also called assessment for learning. In this scenario, it's not just a case of making the same choices as if it was an assessment. Security can be intrusive, can harm the student's learning experience and might decrease your ability to provide detailed feedback. Escape rooms for learning would ideally have a very different approach. We'll talk about escape rooms for evaluation first, then return to escape rooms for learning. But first, I want to briefly exp explain what I mean by validity in the context of assessment. We've dramatically simplified validity for the purposes of this presentation and the guidelines. There are many types of validity, but within assessment, all essentially measure the extent that assessment evaluates what it's supposed to. No assessment is inherently more valid than another. It's a balance that depends on what the purpose of the assessment is and the learning outcomes being assessed. Slide me, April. Oh, thank you. When you use an escape room for evaluation, keep in mind that no single assessment can achieve all assessment goals. So the escape room should be considered in the context with all the assessments in the whole course or program. That takes a little bit of pressure off too, because the assessment doesn't need to do everything. Often in assessment, the focus is primarily on security. And for good reason. If a student cheats in an escape room, then we clearly aren't assessing what we think we are. It's not a valid assessment of their knowledge or their skill. But some security measures can cause students to be assessed on their ability to handle pressure, stress and surveillance instead of the actual learning outcome. And this impacts validity too. If you assess knowledge or skill, 
outside your learning outcomes, then your assessment potentially isn't a valid evaluation of that learning outcome. This is really important in escape rooms when it comes to things like speed. If a student can read information and process it, but not at speed, are you just assessing their reading speed? If a puzzle requires dexterity and coordination, are you assessing that or the learning outcome? And again, that depends on what the learning outcome is. In relation to authenticity, escape rooms are often authentic in some features and not others. Some escape rooms help you to identify what a student will do in the field in future. For example, an emergency room under pressure with a team. Now, if that's your learning outcome, then the aspects of pressure and teamwork can increase validity. But if your assessment is of a less applied learning outcome, such as the ability to do medical calculations, then authentic features might actually impact the assessment of that learning outcome. So consider the learning outcome and what's important for that student cohort to demonstrate at that level in this course and program. Your decisions will all be very context dependent, so the guidelines can't be prescriptive. They just raise things for you to think about and to make your own choices. If your escape room is for evaluation, the ultimate goal is to ensure that it evaluates the learning outcomes effectively. If it doesn't, it may have low validity as an assessment and you might consider modifying the escape room, considering it perhaps for a learning purpose, or maybe going right back to look at the learning outcomes themselves to see if they really reflect what you want the students to know and do. Two examples of how security, authenticity and equity considerations might play out are in terms of technology and hint systems. Technology in the room is often an automatic no based on security, uh, but technology is often an inclusion tool. For example, someone writing digitally instead of on paper, using a phone torch to see better in the room while maintaining the escape room atmosphere for others, using translation tools on their phone or using a phone to magnify text. Device use is also often very authentic for the workplace. Typically, staff can seek answers from others and look things up in online sources such as a pharmacopoeia or calculate things. So to accommodate that, consider could you set up an inclusive, authentic escape room that allows students to seek their answers in multiple ways, such as within the room and online? To increase security, could you use puzzles that you know have misinformation online, forcing students to look for reliable sources? Could you decrease the impact of students sharing answers amongst themselves by using puzzles that are easily changed for each cohort, such as a numerical puzzle where a different number is the solution each time? Also consider if the student is working in a group, does it matter whether they outsource knowledge of this kind to an online source or to the student group? Is the group there simply as a repository of knowledge or for teamwork and communication? Considerations for hint systems are similar. You might consider that hints are less authentic because hints aren't given in the workplace. But if a colleague was stuck, would you help them or just sit back? Support and help are given in the workplace, so maybe hints are authentic. It might also be a more accurate reflection of the student's learning. If a student misses one puzzle and is prevented from escape room completion, is that still an accurate reflection of their level of competence in that learning outcome? Slide me, there. thank you. When an escape room has the express purpose of learning instead of evaluation, then there's much more leeway to make decisions that prioritise the overall experience that's inclusive and accessible to everyone. It gives you flexibility to embed feedback from multiple sources such as peers, the student themselves, the game master, and in multiple forms. Authentic features can be really useful to create an immersive learning experience, but they might not be very appropriate in an assessment if they detract from the learning outcomes. Consider what would you change if inclusion, engagement and learning was prioritised over security? 
In these guidelines, we've spoken fairly extensively about access, equity and inclusion. We've used the universal design for learning framework and the social model of disability, which says that a person isn't inherently disabled, but the environment is disabling. Sorry, I had to let my dog out just beside me there. <laughs> um, but the environment is inherent is disabling. It's not that a person can't access your escape room, but rather that your escape room isn't accessible. So accessibility should be inbuilt, not retrofitted. So you can incorporate as many considerations as possible during design. You can best support varied needs by embedding three things, choice, flexibility and transparency. Now, there's no comprehensive list of these, these areas that applies to all escape rooms. It's always going to be dependent on your specific course and learning outcomes, your escape room purpose and its characteristics. But Accessibility doesn't mean making your escape room boring and vanilla, and it doesn't mean taking away everything you love about it. Transparency might start with things like letting students know in the course outline that there'll be an escape room so they can opt out if they've experienced confinement, trauma or something similar. You can invite questions and practice learning with puzzles in your curriculum. For some students, allowing them to visit the escape room with the puzzles covered or removed can help them to plan or decrease their anxiety. Choice can be accomplished in many ways, such as having several, several puzzle pathways. The diagram here shows a non-linear game flow. There are two pathways from Act 1 to Act 2 via either Puzzle A or Puzzle B. Puzzle A might be a text-based puzzle, while puzzle B might be practical or numerical. And this gives students an ability to work on puzzles that suit their skills and not be prevented from succeeding based on an unrelated but single barrier. Whether this works for you, again, is going to depend on your specific context. Similarly, you might allow students technology options, such as whether to find an answer in the room or access it online, as I've mentioned. And in some escape room themes, that's on theme and can still be highly immersive. Embedded flexibility can give students autonomy over their own learning. For example, delivering an escape room that has a tight time option and a longer time option for students to choose from. You'd be surprised what students choose. Students know themselves and their cap capabilities and allowing them to make those choices can support their learning. Also consider the amount of paperwork you may have saved a student when they don't have to go and apply for those adaptations. Students with disabilities often spend a lot of time with that type of red tape and that leaves much less time for learning. That's not equitable. Finally, if you're thinking about the reasons that you don't want to make these changes, think about a feature from your escape room that you feel adds substantially to the atmosphere or the authenticity. You're likely excited about what this escape room can add to your students' learning. Is this feature accessible? Now I want you to consider whether that feature is so important that it justifies excluding one of your students entirely from that learning experience. Thanks so much for listening to some of the highlights about the guide. Uh, it will go live in the near future. And if you'd like to access a copy, you can email Guru at the address provided here, uh, guru.core at anu.edu.au. We do consider the guidelines to be a living document and we plan to develop and update it over time. So we would really love your feedback. Also, if you do implement the guidelines in any way, please get in touch because we'd love to hear about it. Now, if you have any questions, please either pop your hand up or type them into the chat now and April will read some of them out for us. So thank you so much, good April um, and Sue.